We want to thank Brother Tito for those words of complimentary nature. And there's no need of me telling you that I don't appreciate being complimented and spoken well of. Even my master had to be spoken well of. He appeared and John the Baptist was being baptizing the river Jordan. Unexpectedly, he, uh, Jesus appeared. John stopped to tell the multitude, there's a great man in our midst. In fact, the greatest man that ever lived is in our midst. He introduced Jesus to that mass of people. John the Baptist said to the multitude that didn't know him and didn't know he was present, the Lamb of God is in the audience. The Lamb of God, and he told what the Lamb was going to do. He's going to take away the sins of the world. No greater man has ever been introduced, and never will be. But did you know Jesus, not selfish like us, bestowed turns right around and pays the compliment back, and tells the multitude, among them born of a woman, none greater than John. He wouldn't cheat John, he gave him what was doing. A lot of us today know good things about each other, but sometimes we're so selfish, sometimes we allow Satan to make us jealous, and we won't say the nice things that we could say about one another. I hope today will come in the hearts of men that they need soften that they'll be made a free from jealousy, envy, and malice, and strife. Jesus introduced John, and you know, he made that great introduction there, and bond of a woman, he said. That just, that knocked Abraham over, and knocked Moses over, and knocked all the great men of God over, and said, none, none of them greater than John. That's written on the pages of inspiration. There for the whole world to recognize and to admit. So I thank Brother Cato for those words that he said about me and introducing me to you. Not that I'm so much, but because of the fact that Jesus is using me, I'm letting him use me. All of us could let Christ use us. And we could do greater and greater things for the world and for the people, but just let Christ take charge of the whole man. Over 65 years ago, I said, Lord, if you'll help me to preach the gospel and use me to thy glory, I'll preach it as long as I live. I'll live it so I won't destroy it with evil doing. I'll preach it and live it. Did you know for 65 years I've spent my life, and I've spent my time preaching the gospel. I never did preach regular for no church. I never was the minister of no church. I didn't have time. <laughs> I didn't have time. I wanted to preach every day, every day, every day. And that's about what I've done all of these 65 years. Now the brethren that are preaching for these churches now regular, if somebody hadn't have sowed the seed of the kingdom into the hearts of the elders of this church, they wouldn't, we wouldn't be in here tonight. Some preacher that's preaching for this congregation, the brethren had made the selection of the man that's preaching for them. Don't need to be surprised. The gospel's being taught to them, and the elders of this church is seeing that their doctrine is taught. And the preacher that's preaching for them, they were careful in selecting him. And I want to let you know, I don't know him so good, but uh, I'm sure he's right out of college. <clears throat> What'd you say college for? Out of school. 
What would we do today without schools? Our Christian schools are the greatest blessing to the church today. Move this Christian schools and the church has no talent. They don't want to have a debate. They wouldn't have nobody to select in and prepare to debate it. Go to some college and ask the president, who can I get? And they'll name you the man. And he'll need anybody. You've got the minister preaching for you here now. You're not ashamed of him, but he's been to college. Christian education is the hope of the world. Without Christian education, the church would be dwelling in darkness today. We might as well admit it. We might as well agree that Brother Keeble is right. Why, the Bible tells me that the one of the greatest sinners in the world became a gospel preacher, chief of sinners. But before he did that, they tell me he had more education than all the other apostles. Highly exalted from an educational standpoint. And Apostle Paul, I have reference to. And what did you do? You know what you do. The, the, the record tells you that Apostle Paul become not only the chief of sinners, but the chief apostle. Now you all, now you young men, don't be ashamed of your school. Don't be ashamed of the college where you're attending. Learn all you can. Prepare to meet the world. Stand up in the pulpit someday and preach the gospel and the church won't be ashamed of you. <clears throat> Somebody said, when I was selected to be the president of the National Christian Institute when it first started, the board of directors said this. We're going to call a meeting and we're going to find a man to head the school and from the whole, the lot fell on me. There's some jealous fell in the crowd to know that I did. He could throw me by the, using this thing. He said, uh, Brother Burton, I don't have no objection to Brother Keeble, but he don't have his degree. <clears throat> He's never been to college. He's never had his brains expanded. <laughs> <clears throat> and Brother Burton, being chairman of the board of directors at David Lipson College, and I'm sorry to tell you today, there's a great man awfully sick in the hospital at Nashville now. But you'd have to look hard to find a greater man that's done more for the church than A.M. Burton. He said, well, I think he was qualified for it. He may not have his degrees, and the State of Board of Education doesn't demand that the president have any education at all. <laughs> well, it was pulling for me, wasn't it? <laughs> he was pulling for me, and he come up with this, and they couldn't do nothing with him. All the Board of Education demands in the state board and even the city board of education is that the teachers have their degrees. President don't have to have nothing. <laughs> That's it. Now then, I was sitting there wondering was I going to get it. <laughs> I know the man was telling the truth. I've done all the work that I've done and I have to give the glory to God. I have never gone past the seventh grade. President for 25 years of the National Christian Institute without any degrees at all. But I got them later. <laughs> I, worked on, I worked up on them. Down here at Dallas, Brother Gaines, president of one of the greatest colleges in the world, but he called me a doctor. Pronounced it to the congregation, Dr. Keeble. So now you're looking at Dr. Keeble. I didn't get it the way you got it, but I got it all right. <laughs> and I want you to know I had my robe on. <laughs> oh, yeah, and some of you all sitting there were witnesses of the fact when the robe was put on me and my cap and gown. Dr. Keeble, I'm not boasting. 
Just bragging a little. <laughs> and if I was boasting, if I was, I've got scripture for it. And somebody says, where are you going to find it in scripture for boasting? The apostle Paul once asked the church to permit him to boast. Paul begging them to let him boast. I'll tell you right now, we got scriptures if you boast, but be sure you got something to boast for. Live so that you won't be a disgrace to the church. Do all the good you can. Love everybody. Malice toward no man. No hatred in your heart. And that's the reason Brother Janus, president of that great college, Harding College, no greater in the world. No greater college in Abilene Christian College with Don Morris at the head of it. I met him over in Korea when I was on the tour around the world. And he and I chatted together and had a great time. And when the Southwestern Christian College started, and she was behind with the money she needed, what did you do, Keeble? I came over here and lectured and raised $2,000 for it. And today we have it down here at Terrell. National Christian Institute in Nashville, Tennessee, turning out preachers every year. What would the church do if it wasn't for our Christian school? I spoke at David Lipscomb College on the last lectureship. You're not supposed to preach at a lectureship when they ask you to speak. They don't mean preach. But when you get up there and do it, and they all sitting back there behind you, they can't stop you, so go ahead and preach. <laughs> I went ahead and preached uh, that this last day of the, the lectureship, and 23 coming all out of the galleries and down the line, young people coming to come to obey the gospel of Christ. Some to be restored and some to be baptized. <laughs> Brother Pullius, one of the greatest presidents of our schools, living today, was right behind me, and he said, Keeble, you're making history. I knew it. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it, I, I, but I thanked him for telling me. And on top of that, show you what Christian education will do. Those young ladies and young men that are making confessions, they ask for the police and them to let me, let me baptize them. Christian education. Hey Amen. You know about grunting. You know the Church of Christ is going to uh, go to say amen, director. Did you know you're killing your preacher when you don't let him know you know and believe what he says? You're trying to kill me now. I ain't going to let you do it. <laughs> all right. All right. I'm not going to let you do it. The Church of Christ is going to have to learn when the gospel preach and let the world know that she loves it. Amen. Oh, amen. Now, where's that man at? <laughs> Surely he ain't in the Church of Christ. <laughs> ah, do you know? Do you know, do you know, and I know Brother Harper sitting back there will agree with me, one of the greatest preachers that got in the brotherhood, I know when he started. Uh, he was going to school when I was over there preaching at, at the Jackson, Tennessee, but he encouraged me. He encouraged me and know, had a lot to do with me preaching the gospel to them. He all Harper. Yeah, but I want to know they wouldn't have him around here nowhere if they hadn't been to college. <laughs> you know, <laughs> in the baseball world, and in the football world, and in the basketball world, what makes them boys make them baskets, make them touch down, knock them home runs? It's a yell from the crowd. They're applauding from the crowd. Who couldn't knock a home run with that many people hollering? <laughs> Come right back and knock another one. All we preachers need in the Church of Christ is a little encouragement. You give me a little bit now, and I'll go home run. <laughs> I do it if you help me. <clears throat> the day is coming when the church, you did you know, Vanderbilt has already hired one of the basketball Negro players already. What's the matter with him? He has topped. He talks, and Vanderbilt called them in and hired them for the next season. Remember the Church of Christ, too, Brother Harper? 
the member of the Church of Christ that made me so happy I didn't know what to do. On the Vanderbilt basketball team, but he's a member of the Church of Christ. And I heard him talking your Sunday when he was talking at the church where his membership is. He said he's going to stand up for Jesus, play ball. I don't play ball. He's standing up for Jesus. That kind of boy would be always putting the ball in the back. Thank you. I'm glad you're here to help me along. I don't know who you are, but you're doing me a lot of good. <laughs> And you know I was so glad to hear Brother Cato said that Brother Sinclair, he and Brother Sinclair working together, one for a Canadian school and another one for a Negro school in Nashville, Tennessee. But the Church of Christ has got so much Christ in her today, they don't care why you live that just for your man and help you to be better. They'll help you. Canadians, they'll help you if you want to hear you. Don't you doubt the Church of Christ. Amen. And if you are here tonight, not a member of the Church of Christ, the Church of Christ will help you. And I want to say to you tonight, my friends, I want to lift Christ up to you tonight. And I want to extend the invitation. A few days ago, I better tell this, Brother Cato, this is too good to not tell. Brother Collins, the Vice President of David Lipscomb College, asked me to speak at the, at the, at the high school. They have a high school that lets them come over and speak in the chapel, everyone, every day. And I went over there, and here come 18 of them down. Just right on down. Want Brother Keeble to baptize them. What's the matter, Brother Keeble? It's because of the fact everybody knows that Jesus said, If you lift me up, don't think you'll do it now. He said, I'll draw all men unto you. Well, you see people coming down, down. They're not coming to Keeble. They're not coming to no man. If you lift Christ up like you ought to, they're coming to Christ. Amen. I'll help myself out right now. <laughs> Can't get it from everybody else. Can't even get it from Brother Gates. So he's sitting up there behind. Brother Sinclair, where are you at? <laughs> oh, I now, now, where are these men at? They ought to be saying amen every time I'm not started. All the way. I'm asking the crowd now. Ain't that that right? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, I tell you, brother, to help me. And anybody that won't help an old man by the 87 years old, something's the matter with you. <laughs> 87 years old. Need all the help he can get. Poor thing can't get it. Now, now then, where are you going now, people? I'm going to the 11th chapter of the book of St. John. And Jesus Christ came back after being off a long time from Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Jesus came back one day after a long absence. The sisters were glad to see him, but they had bad news for him. And they told him, said to Jesus, our brother Lazarus is dead. Well, Jesus knew he was dead. They didn't know he knew. He already knew it. He knew everything. He knew every he knew the boy had Lazarus was dead, but these sisters, he said, he well loveth is dead. And Jesus said, He show me where he laid him at. I'm the resurrection and I am the life. Show me where you laid him. I don't care nothing about him being dead. Show me where you laid him at. That's the way you that's all. You got to be depend on Christ. And what did he do? They carried him over there to the grave. Showed them the very spot where they laid him. Right there. But he didn't tell nobody to get no dirt or shovel and shovel the dirt off of him and let him get out and loose that casket. He didn't do that. What did he do? He said he walked up to the grave and called him by his name. I want to emphasize that too. He called him by his name. What did he call him by his name for? He didn't want everybody in the cemetery to get up. <laughs> Amen, amen. <laughs> he could have raised the wall just as easy. That's the confidence I've got in Christ. But he just wanted one man. And I want to emphasize this fact. Somebody might be sitting here telling there's nothing in the name. If he hadn't called Lazarus by his name, he never would have heard it. 
that's right. I got it that time. It's a little slow, but it's... <laughs> All right, I'll be over there to see you today. All right, you know you're going to have to, brother, and give it to the old man. Preach the gospel, brother Keeble. All of us will back you up. All the brothers, that's the reason this big crowd is here tonight, expecting brother Keeble to preach the gospel. Ain't nothing to Keeble. It's the gospel, the message that he has. Ain't nothing to him. As Jesus said, don't lift me yourself up. Lift me up. Lift me up and I'll draw you. You call him by his name. Up, up, pop, lad. The mother said he didn't call this place. <laughs> and that's the way these churches are today. If you didn't name them, they're going to just lay there. You, somebody said any church will do. Now that's a pitiful thing, ain't it? You go to the airport and the man asks you, what, what plane you're going on? And your ticket says, yes, any of them will do. You ain't going nowhere. <laughs> Ah, you ain't going to, till you find out what plane you're going to ride, you ain't going nowhere. And the name better be on that ticket. And then you stand in the judgment for Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God to be judged. That name is going to matter. No other name is given among men, whereby we must be saved. No other name under heaven. That name mounts to suffer. And they let the chapter that Christians will call Christians first to die to y'all. Christians, they wasn't called anything else. You can't be a Christian and wear some other name. If you're not a Christian, you ain't fit to heaven. You're not ready for heaven. I, he said all the disciples were called Christians, first at Antioch. And I venture to say to you, my friends, tonight, that there's no other name under heaven given among men. No other way, no other way. I, Jesus gave us to understand before he left here. I am the way. I am the truth. No man come to the Father except by me. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. And when he came into Caesarea Philippi, and he asked him, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, asked? He asked the disciples that. What did the disciples say? Some of them said, to him, John the Baptist, Jeremiah, Elias. Did he take that? No. Turned to the disciples and said, who do you say I am? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And when he said that, he said, flesh and blood. Did reveal that to you, but my Father, which is in heaven. I want to go into, I want to wear a name when I go up before my master, the name that he gave me to wear. How many of you men would live with your wife if you tell you tonight when you get back home, I wear your name no more. You say, well, get out of here. See that? You don't want no woman in the house who will wear your name. Christ don't want nobody in this church who won't wear his name. You got to wear his name, thank you, brother. Amen, Brother Cato said. You're going to have to do it, friends. You're going to have to do it. And keep yourselves unspotted from the world. And Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It, not them, not it. Just why I've been preaching the gospel over 65 years. And I've told the people there isn't but one church. And that one church wears his name. I was preaching at Los Angeles once. Extended in the session. After we had them all seated, one young man just stood. He remained standing. And I noticed he was going to stand, and I said, uh, Something you want to ask me about this doctrine I preach? He said, Yes, sir. He said, What about my church? He said, Big crowd there under the tent. What about my church? Well, I said, I don't know what church you represent, what church you in. He says, I'm a Latter-day Saint. I say, you're too late. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Come on, he thought he was in something. The man, well, late. <laughs> a Latter-day Saint. I thought I had made him mad. That next night, I saw him come under the tent. I recognized him. I walked up to him, shook his hand, and told him I was glad to see him. And when I extended the invitation that night, here he comes. Here he comes. The white church at 12 in Hoover let me baptize him over there. And after I baptized him, I walked to him, to him and shook his hand. I said, I'm so glad that you obeyed the gospel tonight. He said, I don't say nothing that's too late. <laughs> there you are. He's too late. He come out of that faith. 
I want to say to you tonight, if you're a member of some church not in the Bible, you're too late. Nearly 2,000 years late. The Word of God tells you that Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church. Preaching in Birmingham, Alabama some years ago, and a lady heard me preach, and she said, Brother Keeble, I, 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 she, she went home, rather, pardon me. She went home and told her husband he's going to work that next morning. She said, Smith, I'm going to be baptized. Brother well, Keeble's got some people to baptize down there at the river, at the branch. I went right through Inslee, Alabama, and I'm going down there and bat baptized. And he was a deacon in the Macedonian Baptist Church. You know what she told him? She said, now I don't care what you say. I didn't want to slip off. I want to let you know I'm going to be baptized. I ain't going to let him leave town without baptizing him. He said, if you do, you'll never eat another piece of my bread. She said, well, I was going to do it because more men got bread than you. <laughs> and she stood there and let him know she wasn't going to slip off. And that woman lived a faithful life in Christ until she died. Don't let nobody bluff you. Jesus gave the keys to the apostles, and the keys of the kingdom are the only thing that will let you into the church of Christ. And we teach the boys that they're going to preach the gospel in the National Christian Institute. And over in the Canadian school, Brother St. Clarendon sent them out with that same message that I'm preaching. And you are supporting men like that. You're supporting Christian education. Help everything you can to promote your boys and keep them out of poll rooms and gambling dens and let them go preach the gospel. Teach them what they ought to know and how they ought to live. Stop them from dancing, giving balls and dancing all night. You know, I, the other day, I, yesterday, they served us a meal on the plane. The lady had a package of cigarettes laying on the waiter. She didn't know where I was going to be The brother Kate told her, picked up the package and read what it says on it. Even the, even the proprietor, the manufacturer of the cigarettes, tells you that the thing is poison. Sure did. I've been riding a long time. That's the first time I ever read that on the package. You know. When a man sells you something and tells you it's dangerous and you buy it, he's got his duty. <laughs> you ain't got no more sense of smoke than just exposes. <laughs> Told you on the street. Awesome. You get on there, but I don't know whether it's anywhere else or not. That's the first time I ever saw that. They've been laying them on there, but they didn't have that kind of right on them. But now this, the government of our country demands, if you sell a man something that will kill him, you must get it on the outside. Is that right? No! And Uncle Sam said, then if he smoked the thing and killed it, then you will pray. If you got that label on that, and he smoked it and he killed it, you the call it. Uncle Sam said, you can't sell your cigarette unless you tell the man the thing smoked it. You know, young men, young men, Young men, you like a young, two young preachers, Ben Sandburn of Ben McCallum, and you're going to go to the college. Our college is good. We got the boys in our Christian college. We won't stop smoking cigarettes. And the preacher, the teacher, the president, and all the faculty are telling you that Ben's poison. And now the man that manufactures the thing tells you it's dangerous. You know, the little bottle. There you are, there you are, then it then comes. And we won't touch nothing yeah, like that to you see our children. And the worst thing you ever saw in your life is a woman smoking cigarettes. She's the worst looking thing in the whole country. Pardon me, women, I don't mean no harm. But I got to say, tell the truth and say it. Got to tell the truth. I may lose your friendship, but I've got to preach the gospel like this way. And if four of us, four of us preachers of the church of Christ and preaching straight like that, when you would see so many sitting up on the rest of us to lay down the church door. On Sunday morning, step right out of there. It's pretty hard to take the Lord's Supper before you sing the Lord. And my dear life is then going out the door. I, when I go, I like to uh, You know one thing. 
Babe Ruth used to knock home runs, and he always knew when he knocked one, because he saw it when he went over the fence. I knocked Bella here tonight, and I know it's gone. Home run, but nobody had any grudge. Now, here's yep, what you want. Here's what you want. You want the truth. You want, you want it preached. And our young man sitting here, just as nice as it is, you want to preach the gospel? And we will do it. I said, don't touch it. This face of the church, it reaches in front of the church, it destroys men's souls. They touch not, taste not, and handle not. That's what the Bible says. Touch not. Don't you touch the face. Oh, he had that type of cigarette, and I didn't even roll it open. Why? I read the label. The label told me it was poison. Now then, I want to say to you, my friends, in my concluding remarks, and I trust that somebody here tonight that wants to be baptized, and this big crowd don't bother you. When you want to be baptized on the day of Pentecost, about 3,000 obeyed the gospel. Stepped out on God's word the first time the gospel was free. I'm about free thousand. And a lot of you ought to come out tonight and take a stand with Jesus. And don't be ashamed. Walk out on his word. Says, Brother people, I see I'm wrong. I want to be a power. I want to be the light of the world. I want to help save men. Turn my back on mother, husband, and wife, and everybody, and come into my faith. I said, I'll give unto you the keys of the kingdom, and whatever you bind on earth should be bound in hell. And I have five keys in Jesus' mind. Hear into the gospel, believe in the gospel, repenting of your sins, confessing Christ, and perhaps you will wash your sins away. Them keys, when you use them right, unlocks a man's heart. All five of them, take all five of them to put you in Christ. Are you here tonight? Yes, Are you here yes, not ashamed? Yes, yes, Are you bold yes, enough? Yes, anybody yes, here that has drifted yes, away yes, out of the fold of God, that slid like the prodigal yes, son, go to your life and go to your father tonight. Come to your father tonight. Today is a day of salvation, and now is acceptable time. Will you come? Will you accept him tonight while you're sitting here listening? Won't you come while we all stand?